We've already talked about America's pigeon guided bomb from World War II. And America's Bat Bomb from World War II. So today we're just going to finish off the topic and discuss the three remaining animal weapons from World War II and World War II alone. Because if we went in detail on every animal weapon throughout the course of human history, we would be here literally all day long. Because trust me when I tell you that people have been trying to kill other people with animals and fire for as long as people have been a thing. I mean, just to gloss over a couple, back in the day the standard operating procedure for combating war elephants was to take a bunch of pigs, light them on fire, and release them onto the battlefield to simultaneously scare the fuck out of Dumbo and cook dinner at the same time, which honestly is just god tier level multitasking. And then in like 900 AD, you had Olga of Kiev burning down an entire city with flaming pigeons, subsequently killing like 5,000 people, and there was no PETA back then, so she later on became a saint, which is like the most gangster kill streak of all time. Look, I'm not saying it's right, but to achieve both of those things in one lifetime is impressive. And then in the 1200s, you had Genghis Khan, who did pretty much the exact same thing, except he used cats instead. And then here's a German military manual from the 1500s that clearly depicts how to do both of these strategies. I guess the point I'm trying to get at is people have literally been trying to light each other on fire using animals for all of human history, and it gets progressively worse and more weird the longer time goes on, until it would eventually peak during the Cold War when Britain made a chicken-powered nuclear landmine, but all of that's a story for a different time. All right, kicking off our animal-based weapons of World War II list in absolutely no particular order that somebody is still gonna tell me I'm wrong about somehow, we have the United States cat bomb. Except instead of using pigeons that were trained for six months to peck at the shape of a ship, the OSS, or Office of Strategic services, which was basically like the CIA back then, got together, they said training pigeons for six months takes too long, we're just going to try throwing a cat in there to see what happens. And their logic was, cats always land on their feet and cats hate water. So if we stick one inside of a bomb, yeet it out the back of a plane, and all it can see is a giant ship and the ocean, it will instinctively drive the bomb into the ship because it doesn't want to land in the water and get wet. Now, to be fair, that makes sense if you don't think about it. So the government's like, I mean, let's give it a shot. What do we have to lose? It's just taxpayer money and stray cats. Who gives a fuck? So that's exactly what they did. And not only did it fail, it failed quicker than anybody could have possibly imagined. Because as it turns out, not only did cats not instinctively know how to drive a 500 pound bomb, but they also lose consciousness when free falling. Uh, so the US government just drowned a bunch of cats. Uh, so yeah, it's definitely warheads on foreheads, not felines on foreheads. Write that down, moving on. Coming in at number two, we have the Soviet Union's anti-tank dogs. It's a pretty straightforward and shitty concept. Basically, the Soviets would train a bunch of dogs that there were treats underneath tanks. They would then send the dogs to the front line, put a bomb vest on them with a large lever on the back in the hopes that the dogs would run, dive underneath German tanks looking for treats. That would throw the lever back, which would set off the bomb vest, blowing up the dog, and hopefully blowing up the German tank. Now, I think we can all agree that that's a really shitty thing to do to the goodest comrade. However, there is a silver lining because karma would hit back really hard on this one. You see, as it turns out, the Soviets were just training with whatever they had available, and they didn't have very many German tanks laying around, so they were training the dogs using Soviet tanks. What most people don't realize is Soviet tanks ran on diesel, and German tanks ran on gasoline. Not a huge difference in appearance to a human, but to a dog who uses its sense of smell, it's an enormous difference. So big, in fact, that the dogs pretty much exclusively ran and dove underneath Soviet tanks, blowing up their own comrades. Karma's a bitch. And finishing off our list, we have Britain's Exploding Rat. Basically, they were going to take a bunch of dead rats, scoop out their insides, and fill them full of plastic explosives. They would then use a spy network to smuggle in these rats to important strategic locations and just kind of like sprinkle them around near-ish the boiler room in hopes that the boiler room technician would find a dead rat, say, huh, and then throw it into the fire for the boiler, blowing it up, causing a bunch of mayhem. And I know what you're thinking. Why on earth would you use a dead rat? Why not just use a fake piece of coal full of explosives like the Americans did in the Civil War? That makes way more sense. That's exactly what I thought. But then it hit me. And hear me out when I say this. Maybe, just maybe, it's more likely that they would throw a rat into the fire, and here's why. You see, the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Death, literally killed off like half of Europe. 
and the bubonic plague was spread from fleas that were living on rats, meaning that it stands to reason that a significant portion, if not all of the people on the European continent during World War II had a genetic predisposition to seeing a dead rat and being like, cast it into the fire. Now, despite the fact that this was actually a good idea, it never actually panned out the way they planned because Germany actually intercepted the first batch of exploding rats they ever made, at which point Britain decided to cut their losses on the entire idea because the Germans knew what they were up to. However, the Germans didn't know that, so they spent the rest of World War II inspecting every dead rat they found to see if it was an explosive rat or not. And the best way to do that was to look at the rat's ass because it had a fuse sticking out of it. And funnily enough, this is exactly where the phrase, I don't give a rat's ass came from because after a bunch of German boiler technicians spent months or years looking at dead rats balloon knots and never finding a fuse ever, they said, fuck it, I'm done looking at rat buttholes. And they just started throwing the rats in the fire without checking. Hence the term, I don't give a rat's ass. To be completely honest, did I just make that shit up? Yeah. Is it true? Fucking maybe, but I doubt it. However, I did have you going for a second. Now, origins of the phrase, I don't give a rat's ass aside, the British do consider this entire mission an enormous success just due to the sheer amount of man hours that Germany wasted looking for explosive rats that never actually existed. So, you know, task failed successfully, I guess. In conclusion, nothing quite stokes the fire of human creativity like trying to kill a motherfucker that you don't like. And creativity is absolutely imperative because, well, you know, it's never a war crime the first time. And on that note, thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch at thefatelectrician.com. Quack bang out.